Jonesboro, Tennessee, the storytelling capital of the world, and broadcasting from the International Storytelling Center, it's Jonesboro's original storytelling radio hour, A Night with the Yarn Exchange. residents who came up during the hard times of the Great Depression and World War II. People who found a way to use and appreciate everything they had. <coughs> Their determination not to be defeated, even when all seemed bleak, provided the glimmer of hope needed to come out of those dark days. Their experiences shaped the better part of the 20th century and provide powerful examples of what it is to live in gratitude. Well said, Lee. Tonight we've got stories about finding gratitude, losing gratitude, and, well, discovering it, rediscovering it, through kind acts and gestures from family and neighbors. And speaking of gratitude, we'd like to thank our sponsors for making this program possible. Our program is sponsored by Mountain States Health Alliance, medical experts you can trust with world-class facilities and the latest technology close to home. We'd also like to thank the Tennessee Arts Commission for their support of our program. I also want to mention our musical guest, Dustin Miller. He'll be joining us in tonight's show, weaving his blend of blues. And of course, we'd like to thank the makers of parsley. Yes, parsley. That smooth, easy-going flavor that enhances every meal. Sprinkle it on or garnish a dish. It just tastes better with parsley. <laughs> Mom, do mornings come too early for you? Then frozen toast is the answer. From the freezer to the toaster, what could be simpler than frozen toast? Hit it, kids. It's a breakfast sensation from coast to coast. Stories. Lori, I want to point out that gratitude is more than being thankful. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Websburts describes gratitude as the quality of being thankful and a readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. Uh, I, I practice gratitude. I do things for people who help me. That's it, Summer. You've got it. <laughs> I have a little story to share, but it is a strange one to start out with. It's gratitude for a spanking. <laughs> My cousin and I were in first grade. The school was on a hill. We had no cafeteria, 
So they would let the children come down and buy lunch at a place down the hill for a quarter. My grandmother worked at one of the stores downtown. She got a call from one of her fellow workers. Look, Belle, look over there. Aren't those your grandkids? They sure are, and they're not walking in the direction of school. Where do you think they're going? Mm -hmm. They're heading right to their cousin's house. Before I knew it, my grandmother was marching right behind us. She swatted us, so we turned around. Then she swatted us up the hill back to school. But it wasn't over there. She then marched to Mama's house and told her. We got home, and there was Mama waiting. Mm -hmm. I understand you took a field trip today? <laughs> I told her, not really, Mama. Really? I understand that you went to your cousin's house? Before I could salvage the situation, my brother said, We didn't make it because Grandma found out and she swatted us. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? I just found out too. And we got swatted again. <laughs> And your grandmother and I already talked to the neighbors down there and told them to keep an eye on you and to give you more of the same if they catch you again. You just remember who you are and who you're from. I didn't like it then, but I'm grateful for it. Those were the days when the entire community watched out for you. I strayed from the path, but only briefly. I knew people were looking out for me and I better not stray again. All of us kids in our little community made it through high school. It was almost unheard of. That is almost unheard of today. Times have changed. I'm not nostalgic for spanking and corporal punishment, but I do miss those days where we truly knew our neighbors and looked out for them. All I can do is try to be a good neighbor myself and watch out for others like they watched out for me. I ended up having a lifelong trade because a neighbor was looking out for us. My mother had gotten early arthritis, really bad, but I was in school and she couldn't help me. I took 4-H in a county school and sewing was one of those things. I had to learn it, but Mama's hands were so crippled she couldn't show me. I felt like I forgot what I had learned in school that day by the time I got home. The neighbor saw me working a piece of fabric and gently patted my hand. Honey, stop for a minute. It's okay. Watch what I'm doing. I'm left-handed, so it'll be like you're looking in the mirror. See? She then pulled out some things from her own sewing kit. In those days, when you visited someone, you were always working, whether sewing or mending. That's what you did. I followed along, and she was so patient. She showed me so many things. Okay, next I want you to pull a fringe out, count the strings over, and make a knot. We used flower sacks to make dish rags, and I learned to sew using flower sacks, because we didn't have the money to buy good fabric for me to practice on. Good. Next we're going to make a dish towel, after that an apron. Once you can do that, I think you'll be ready to make some clothes. I made a good dish towel, but I mastered that apron. In 4-H, I excelled, but at home, I realized I could do more around the house to help Mama, including making clothes. When I wore them to school, others admired them. Before long, I had people asking me to make them an outfit. After graduating, I became a seamstress and made a living at it. I still sew today, all because of Miss Helen. Those are some of the wonderful stories that came from the Jonesboro Senior Center people who have seen the better part of the 20th century and certainly helped shape it. Many of these folks would make it through the depression on their small farms, only to take and roll up their sleeves for the larger job of serving their country in need after Pearl Harbor. My father was one of those people, and you know, he never would have understood a selfie stick. <laughs> and he was a photographer. There's something about that generation. The self was not put first. With Dad, it was God first, then country, then family. He put taking care of anyone else first above himself. He used a camera all his life, was a photographer during the war, and you know, 
I don't think he ever did a self-portrait. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. You know, that really is something to think about, and so true. The greatest generation wouldn't understand the concept of a selfie. They come from a time of self-sacrifice, making a place in the world for others. Up next, we've got a story that really captures this notion. Delia, dinner's ready, honey. Y'all come in. And do me a favor, close that barn door. It looks like a real bad storm is trying to blow up. All right, Mama. I'm just picturing, picking a few flowers for the table. Oh, I love this place. You know, when I was coming up, many people around here had a small room at the front of their house, which was used for visitors. It was usually furnished with a bed, a small table, and something to eat, a wash basin, and towel. Travel was hard through these parts. If you had some money, you'd go by stagecoach along the road that runs in front of this theater. But in the early days, more likely than not, folks went on horseback, or even by foot, like our beloved Daniel Boone. If it fell dark when they weren't near a town, they'd sleep under the cover of trees. But if they made it to a small town like this, they could use the visitor's room. It was mighty appreciated, since the Chester Inn was about the only hotel in the whole region. You know, I guess we still carry on that tradition today. During storytelling, we still don't have a lot of hotels, but we get a lot of travelers through here. Two rooms in my home is fixed up for visitors during the festival. And it's just like you described, a bed, a table with snacks, with a few of modern additions like an internet password and little bars of soap. <laughs> we just leave the doors open for them for whenever they get back home. That's also a carryover from my grandmother's day. Didn't know what locks were, didn't have one on our door. We had a visitor's room at my mama's house. There was a quilt on the rack in the window, and that was our sign that you were welcome. If the quilt was removed, it meant someone was already there. Most travelers knew these places. Just like they know who to call during festival. Exactly. But these folks usually arrived after dark and left before dawn. It was customary to leave a token of appreciation. It might be a fruit, a pinned note, or a trinket to show gratitude. It's like we're living the same story. My visitors from festival always leaves me a piece of homemade jewelry when they fashion they fashion for me. The difference is you meet your guests and spend time with them. I never met most of the people that stayed with my grandmother and my mother, but I always knew a little something about them by the things they left behind. One visitor who stayed at our house every two or three months always left a cutting of a plant. It would be wrapped in soil in a moist rag. We had a large empty space beside our house that we called the lane. Grandma planted the cuttings there. The lane filled up with the most colorful flowers and shrubs. As years went by, that lane became the garden, and Grandma called her garden gratitude. By the time Mama was grown, she was living in the house with all of us. She wanted to share gratitude, so she opened it up to everyone. The neighbors loved walking through gratitude with each other. Some brides gathered flowers for their wedding bouquets from gratitude. Families that were having a hard time came to gratitude and picked peas and tomatoes and peppers. There was enough gratitude for everyone. Well, I'm going to tell you what happened in Hoover days. Now, in the Hoover days, it was rough. It was hard to cook anything because whatever you ate, you had to work for it. Just like that snake. <laughs> Nothing was easy. Not even fishing. Didn't have any money for fishing line. Nothing. Marion, where's my line? It was Marion's job to play the sufficient line out of sewing thread. Here's your line. Don't snag it, because I ain't making another one today. Snag <laughs> your line and we don't eat. Well, where's other hooks? Hooks are two cents apiece. One for you, one for me, and one for you. Be grateful you have that. What if we hook a big fish and it swims off? I suggest you swim after it. <laughs> don't lose your hook or we don't eat. Lose your line, we don't eat. Lose your hook, we don't eat. Is there any good news? Yeah, you catch some fish, we'll eat. What about me? Can't I, can't I fish? 
you got a net. That's for minnows. I want to catch a real fish like you. Lucy was too young to fish during Hoover days. It wasn't no time to play around. But doggone, if Daddy didn't give in, Lucy always got what she wanted because she was the youngest. She got what she wanted because she asked for it instead of complaining about it. <laughs> Here you go, sugar. Try this out. Now be careful. Whoops. <laughs> she got Daddy's line stuck in a root. <laughs> then Dad got to grunting and took his shirt off. You going in? Oh well, yeah, I'm not going to lose that line. Lose the line, lose the hook with it. Fishing's over. Daddy dived in to save the hook. He'd barely gone under, then shot right back up with his eyes big. Did you get the hook, Daddy? The heck with the hook! You caught a dang snake! Let me out of here! <laughs> that was the end of Daddy's fishing for the day. Lost the hook, the line, and fish. Snake. <laughs> we trotted on home, but Miss Gladys stopped to talk to her us outside her garden. What'd you catch today? I caught a dang snake and let it go. But it was more fun to watch than a picture, so. <laughs> Reckon we'll be dining on air tonight. I told you not to lose that hook. Fishing might be over, but I've got peas and butter beans in the garden. Mm. All sorts of vegetables. Help yourselves. We don't take handouts. Good, because I ain't given any. I said you're welcome to it. Didn't say I'd pick it for you. You're grown people. You can do that yourself. I plant these things, but it's turned into more work than I can handle. I can't afford to pay you, but if you work the garden, you can take home whatever you pick. <sighs> Come on, kids. Okay, but uh, I'm just going to bring some of these peas home. Ooh, and maybe a couple tomatoes. What? I like tomatoes. Okay, I'm coming. I, be, I like green beans. Come on, Daddy, help me. Oh, all right. But if there's a dang snake in there, I'm leaving. <laughs> We'll return to see what's happening with Miss Gladys and her garden of gratitude a little bit later. Coming up next is Katie Rosalowski with her own story of gratitude. The legacy of people like Miss Gladys and her generation will certainly live on here. Yep, Jonesboro is my kind of town. It's the kind of town where the shopkeeper who helped you with directions, someone from the church you just visited, and three of your neighbors all brought you homemade goodies on the same day. <laughs> it's the kind of town that when a $20 bill falls out of your back pocket, someone grabs it and returns it to you. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Well, it's where the person who mows your lawn leaves you flowers from her own yard. Oh, thank you. It's where you witness the warm hospitality of a town of 5,000 that hosts 10,000 for the Storytelling Festival. It's where the post office and the town employees know your name, and you know theirs. Mm -hmm. It's where a farmer at the market offers you a recipe for the zucchini you just bought. Jonesboro is the kind of place where you can kick up your heels at a visitor's center dance Stomp your feet to live music, laugh out loud in the theater, listen to a story, tell a tale, or see the town through the eyes of people who lived here hundreds of years ago. It's the kind of town where children can wander up and down Main Street because everyone is their guardian. It's where cars always stop for pedestrians and the train always whistles. <laughs> It's where a stranger stops, rolls down the car window, and asks if you need a ride up the hill. Jonesboro is the kind of town where a trip to the grocery store, or anywhere else, takes twice as long because there's no short hellos, <laughs> only long goodbyes. Jonesboro is the kind of town where the back door is usually open, where eye contact is fashionable, and where you can't wait to return home after vacation even if you went somewhere really wonderful. Yep, that's my kind of town. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. You know, your story is not unique. 
At least a few of those things happen to me on a daily basis. Folks, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to the Jonesboro Yarn Exchange radio show on WETS 89.5 out of Johnson City, Tennessee. Thank you. 